This is the I Read Comic Books Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rappin. Joining me this week, two storytelling tropes hell-bent on circumventing themselves, Nick White. Hey. And Paloma. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you both for joining me this week. I'm super excited to be talking comics because you know what? I read so many of them and I just can't wait to expound upon all of them. But before we get into that, I have like four announcements because lots of things have been happening behind the scenes at IRCB. For those of you who use our Patreon or maybe thinking about you joining our Patreon, we now have this brand new IRCB secret feed where you can see all the episodes of our show on Spotify. So if you're a Spotify user and you just want to see what we've got coming down the pipeline from Patreon, plus the backlog of literally hundreds of other stuff, plus our regular episodes, you can subscribe to a new feed. I'm going to post a link to that in the show notes, or you can stay on the new, the regular feed, whatever. It's up to you. I'm not your dad. You can also go to patreon.com slash IRCB podcast, and you can just click follow and see all the updates from the show. Uh, you won't be able to listen to the exclusive content or check out early advanced things like the IRCB schedule or top of our pile when they come out. But when things get posted publicly, you'll get a notification to know, hey, IRCB is something new. I think in the future, we're going to try to use that to post more updates since Twitter is basically dead for us. I think that might be the place where we start to post more updates. So make sure you head over there. We're going to try to keep it very light and not post all the time, but you'll get access to all sorts of stuff as we post updates about the show. One other thing, Zach and I, um, brand new IRCB member, we're going to be heading to ZoloCon in Westminster, Pennsylvania to come find us, get a free button sticker. We're meeting up with a few other folks from the Discord, which is going to be really, really cool. But you know, if you're if you're going to be at ZoloCon for whatever reason, come find us, shoot me a message on Discord or something, and I'd be happy to hang out for a minute. And finally, last thing, we've got a brand new website coming down the line. It looks super Super dope. Kara and Kate and all the marketing folks from IRCB, which is half of the crew, um, have been working on making this site look really, really cool. We've got brand new business cards to go along with it. So look forward to all of that. It's going to be coming really, really soon. Um, all the links for everything are going to be in the show notes, but let's get into things. Let's talk about comic books. So I guess to get things started, I got to ask two legally mandated questions to you, Nick. How have yeah. you been? How have comic books been? Uh, and in return, I, I have a question for you. Is, sure. is, is ZoloCon real? Is that the real name? Is that, that a real? Is the, that is the name. Um, <laughs> okay. Cause it sounds like something that like Bill Hader's character from SNL would be like, you got to go to ZoloCon. It's got everything, <laughs> right? I mean, looking at the description, if you Google ZoloCon, that like, you get taken to this really old ass <laughs> website. Um, and it seems like there's a place that has everything, right? Like <laughs> it's wild. Is that, is that just a, uh, Stefan, I think, Stefan, the yes. character's name. Yeah, yes. yeah, it feels like one of his sketches. Things have been good. If nothing, uh, if if anything, just pretty eventful. My uh, sister and brother-in-law lost power. Um, I think some people know. I guess West Michigan Weather Watch would be things are fine now, but they definitely weren't a couple days ago. Uh, we had a couple storm systems go through. Um, middle of the state got it pretty bad. I think mm -hmm. some small tornadoes touched down. Uh, my sister's been without power for the last, uh, I think, like two or three days. Um, Yikes. But got it back. And so they ended up uh, coming over and uh, staying with me overnight with their 10 month old. 10 month old? I think she's about 10 at this point. So that was, uh, it's it's been eventful the last day or two. And, um, you know, with everybody else it's like well just get the family together and let's do some family things so obviously that includes arguing um but then after the arguing <laughs> right <laughs> after the arguing and all the topics that you you only discuss with family mm -hmm. uh we're like let's let's uh create some memories uh so we went to uh you can tell how excited i am about this um <laughs> I was gonna say, Nick, so let's go to the so excited let's go to the beach and and the, of course i sent my obligatory picture to mike rappin whenever i like go out in nature i just send a picture to mike just to a prove that i went there and then mm -hmm. b if anything terrible befalls me at least people know where to begin looking right you know following it so i am here here are the you know coordinates i'm at the beach send help right nick nick just wants to let me know that he's touched grass this month yeah, I, appreciate I did it that. i did it <laughs> i am outside the confines of my domicile it is true so yeah it's 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 been good um did you read complain. any comics though nick oh is that what this is about Jeez. that's what this is about unfortunately i know 
Wow. What a taskmaster. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I better late than never. I want to talk about uh, the Enfield gang massacre. I know it came out about a week or two ago, but I'm always, you know, um, just a little late to the party. Wasn't on the show since then. So whatever. Uh, sure. so this was written by Chris Condon, art by Jacob Phillips, color assists by Pip Martin. It's obviously tied in. I say obviously, perhaps not to I was, is it that Texas blood? This Texas blood? I always get this wrong. <laughs> that it's Texas that blood. Texas blood. Nick, that I'll Texas be completely blood. honest with you. I didn't yeah. know that this was quote unquote tied in until I let, yeah. read the like end pages of this book. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it's in the same county. I was like, oh, they're not just doing another Western. They're doing a sort of semi-related tie into that Texas blood. Right. So like, it's far from obvious. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's, you, you can ask for those who haven't read it how big are the connections how you know inner you know intertwined is all of this and right now it's it just doesn't seem much more than like it seems like this general area or this town or this county is like Mm -hmm. kind of cursed it almost feels like the land itself feels kind of cursed bad things happen but maybe there's actually more connections um because I immediately tried to like look up some of the names of the characters in this issue and see if it's supposed to be um, sort of the predecessors or ancestors of the characters from that Texas blood. And I sure. don't think it's that simple, but it did make me immediately want to go and just read that Texas blood and try to find anything else mm-hmm. connecting the mm-hmm. two. Beyond that, overall, it is a beautiful setup issue. It does have some well-worn Western tropes. Um, but, you know, does familiarity, you know, breed contempt? I think that's something we're going to talk about later in the show with our topic. Sure. So we can discuss that at that point. But uh, you have this guy named Enfield. He's sort of a storied outlaw. He's staring down the end of a, you know, the end of the truly wild west. Uh, he sees law and order fast approaching and he wonders if it's time to make an honest living. Um, this is like 1875 or so. And this town that he's in, Fort Lahane, Texas, um, which doesn't appear to be real because I did a bunch of Googling trying to find it. I think they made up this story for the city. They're kind of upset with the fact that Enfield basically robs their bank monthly. Um, and he's not real mean about it. He's not like a sadist. He doesn't love violence. He's not trying to kill people. He just casually walks in and goes like, you know, hi, Mort. I'm here for the monthly robbery. And he just steals their money. And the guy goes, you know, civilization is coming and, you know, whatever. And but then the the uh, the banker ends up dead and that's kind of the town finally goes, look, look, it's Enfield, like bad stuff is happening and things just start dialing up from there. Mm -hmm. But the one weird, interesting thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to this, and this is just the weird little niche interest that I found, which may be not interesting to anything, anyone else. But there's an interesting correlation with the beginning of this book, which kicks off in, I think, 1906. So it's sort Mm -hmm. of a a flash. Well, it's sort of the present day before a flashback um, is that they show off a dead body at a Wild West show in its Enfield's body. And it makes me wonder if Chris Condon, the writer, knows a thing or two about the story of Elmer McCurdy, who was a real person. Uh, McCurdy was a bank robber and train robber, and he died in a shootout with police while robbing a train in Oklahoma in 1911. Mm. His body ended up getting mummified, and he was a feature in a traveling carnival from the 1920s through the 1960s. His body. Well, this this feels ahead. like a clear callback to that. Oh, right? oh clearly, like Condon, <laughs> Condon must know about this, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a bizarre story that I just had to share because um, I think other Western writers have even also weirdly decided to pick up on this, mm-hmm. but yeah, so bizarre. It's so weird to talk about a human being like this, but like his body ends up at an amusement zone called the Pike in Long Beach, California. And then while filming an episode of the $6 million man. So a prop man was moving some stuff around this amusement park and he found what he thought was a mannequin in a gallows in like a Western themed part of the park. And oh, he no. tries to move the mannequin, the arm breaks off, and instead of, you know, stuffing coming out, you see, he sees a bone in, like, muscle tissue exposed. Wow. And, and, and yeah, not a mannequin, right? <laughs> and and if, if, if any of you have, like, a really, you know, some spare time and you want to have an interesting read, go look this up. Read some of the rest of it on Wikipedia because, like, they try to figure out who this guy is. You know, they're trying to, like, play CSI, 
decades and decades and decades later, you know, because they didn't know who it was. And and they eventually sure. like sort it all out and there becomes issues of like who's going to bury him. It's a fascinating little fascinating little niche read um, for anybody who's curious. But it was fun to see Chris Condon make what absolutely I feel has to be an allegory to Elmer McCurdy at the beginning of oh, this sure. book. 100 percent. So really just kind of fun to see that little piece of knowledge come in. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Paloma, did you get a chance to read this by chance? I I did, but I don't know if you if you got a chance to look at this. Yeah, I did read it um, when it came the week it came out because the cover was so good. And then right. I was like, well, let me read that Texas Blood. And then reading it, I was like, hmm, no one's name is jumping out. But I I really loved the cover. I liked the setup, and it mm-hmm. worked because it got me to read all three volumes of that Texas Blood. Oh, gosh. and that's that's what we want to hear. That's what we love mm-hmm. to hear on this show. I love that. We we could, and I think we did talk about. I mean, I think we on the show. I say love that book, but my God, I think we mm-hmm. talked about Volume Three forever. That scary man with that scary mask yes. wandering around in that blizzard <laughs> just scares the ever loving shit out of me. <laughs> that scene where he's like creepily opening the window and crawling into the house. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. One thing I, I will say about Enfield uh, Gang Massacre is I really loved, like, Nick, I know you pointed this out in your notes, um, so I'm going to steal this a little bit, but like yeah. Jacob Phillips's work in this book, particularly, there is a full page spread that he does of like a guy who's like turned around and he's looking right at the reader. For some reason, that was like one of the most striking pages in the entire book, like, Phillips has always done a really good job, I think, with facial expressions and like bodily like bodily presentation for different things about like getting a person's vibe just from how they're standing. This page in particular, I, I think if you page through the issue, you'll see this is like a whole there is a a face of shock and awe that you see on this guy and just the, the color work that he does, just these dark reds and browns on this person in the background. Um, probably one of the most stunning pages I've seen him do in a very long time. So yeah, that book rules. If you haven't read it, wait, either wait till the trade comes out because you're going to want to read it all. But like also go pick this up. This book deserves every piece of love out there like uh, Condon and Phillips and co They're They've been doing a fantastic job with all their Western books. And like, I'm glad we got to talk about it on another episode of this show, Nick. So thank and, you. And I will throw this in there in as much as this might drive Danny crazy. OK, I would encourage people to read the prose. I would sure. definitely there's an article at the end that basically talks about the history of the Enfield gang and maybe sets the scene for some things to come. But I read it. I found it really illuminating and interesting. Agreed. And if you haven't, if you haven't read the book, read the prose when you read it. If you've already read the book, go back and read the prose. Um, (laughs) You have homework now. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for listening. There will be a five question quiz on Monday. Um, (laughs) But yeah. That's cool. me. That's that's cool. that's what I've been up to. That's what I've been reading. Nice. Well, Paloma, what about you? What have you been reading? How you been? All that stuff. I've been great. I have one more Enfield thing to promote the oh, floppies. Oh, yeah. It it feels like an older comic. It, the paper is different. It was that yeah. was so, that was one of the selling points. Where I was like, eh, maybe I'll read this later. But then I touched it and I was like, oh, there's thought put into this. It's like one of those old Vertigo books, you yeah. know, like I remember like the one book that comes to mind is like DMZ is like it had that like newspaper mm-hmm. style, like really textured p- paper. And the coloring in that on, on this type of paper is way different than the digital edition because um, I bought oh. both because I'm a sucker. <laughs> um, but like Jacob Phillips's colors are way more muted in the printed edition. And I think that's intentional, right, mm-hmm. with the paper and stuff. I, I thank you for calling that out. But yeah, I just had to give that a shout out. And comics have been great. I feel like I say this whenever I pop onto the show. Maybe I just come on the Lucky Cycles where I'm liking everything that's coming out right now. Hell yeah. And so we, um, at the comic shop I work at, sometimes we get manga delays. And so I was frothing at the mouth for this particular series to come out called Windbreaker Volume 1, uh, written mm-hmm. and drawn by Sator- Satoru Ni and published by Kodansha. It's been released digitally for a while, and I finally got my hands on physical volume one. And we take like a takes place like a high school setting, a new small town. We follow this plucky young boy named Sakura who moves to this town specifically because this high school called Furin is infamous for delinquents. 
and he's just agent okay. for a fight. Your classic. I want to be the strongest. I want to be the top dog. He finds out that the folks in this small town love these delinquent kids because they uh, protect the community. Very community focused. Very nice kids helping old ladies. And so he's very much like, what the hell? And it's just <laughs> your classic, classic tale of like, hey. You're not going to succeed if you're alone. So wholesome. Uh And also these like children, high schoolers are like beating the ever loving snot out of each other. To my (laughs) knowledge, they're all humans. Uh Um, But so far, so far, who's to say? One of the things I've learned as I've read more and more manga is that high school is the most dangerous time of anyone's (laughs) life. And you will probably not live through it. Like, yeah. I don't understand why everyone's like, oh, the average age of Japan is like 89 or something like that. Right. And they're like, oh, you know, the, you know, nobody's having kids, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what is the disconnect with manga? Because it seems like nobody, like nobody makes it past age 18. Right? In, if, if, if you were to believe manga <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. So um, I'm glad to see there's another book where it's like, High school is the most dangerous, most intense time of your life. It's like, okay. Yeah, no, it's it's wild. It's really fun. The character designs are awesome. The art style's mm. really, really good. Our main character, like half of his hair is white and he has a yellow a y- yellow eye, and the other half is like black with a green eye. So he's probably been cool. bullied and that's why he's a loner. I see. I was going to ask, do you know if there's any logic or reasoning? I know with manga frequently there isn't um, for the title because yes. one, I'm five, so I couldn't help but laugh. And I appreciate that you said it with a straight <laughs> face. And then I went, Nick, maybe it's about the article of clothing. Right. And then I right. said, Nick, just ask Paloma. So yeah. that is actually a great question. And they explain it a little because when I'm reading the title, I'm like, oh, item of clothing. And like the uh, kid is like putting on a jacket. It's a school uniform, but I was like, windbreaker, Mm. he's putting on a jacket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Furin is the name of the school, and then they call the kids the nickname Bo Furin, which I think means like wind chime. Furin might mean wind chime. Bo Furin might Hmm. mean the wind that breaks, the wind breaking against the chime. Interesting. I am the wind who breaks. Yeah, Yeah, so a windbreaker is kind of like, I think it's a noun, but it's also like the action of the, it's the name of the school in Japanese or something is the nickname. It's way more whimsical when you're reading it, but that is my literal <laughs> explanation sure, translation. Sure. No, Thank that's you. what I asked for. So I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I want to give a shout out to Kate from last week's episode where she was talking about the K manga app, which is Kodansha's like online manga reading app. So I've been cruising through. Thanks to that app. I gave it a try instead of being skeptical. Nice. Nice. See, this is this is why these apps are so important, right? Because if the, if the entry, if the barrier to entry is super low, you can become obsessed with mm-hmm. something really easily, and then you're more likely to spend money on it. I don't understand why actual Western comic books are $5 each for a brand new number one. I, it's, it's, anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Paloma. <laughs> How much is the Kodansha app, and do they have a chapter limit? Uh, they kind of do. It's like free to download, and if you check check okay. in every day, you get like five tickets. I don't know if you partake in a webtoon, oh, no. but yeah, I haven't check spent ins, any money yet. Tickets. Yep. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I I read Kodansha might be the publisher I read the most, but uh, Nick, um, here here, listen to this. Listen okay, to last okay. week's episode. You'll get all your answers, okay? <laughs> they go through it yeah. in great detail. And quite honestly, I'm ashamed that you haven't listened to last week's I was going to say, so. please please humiliate me for not <laughs> listening to it yet because yes. maybe this is the sort of reinforcement other people need to. So, uh, yes. Go listen to last week's episode, everybody. I wasn't even here. If you can't stand my voice, three wonderful people were talking instead of me last week. Uh, I don't know, let- Nick. Maybe participate in this show that we have on the whole, please, you know. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. We got so many (laughs) comics to get through. For me, though, this week, uh, it's been insane. I wasn't here last week, guys, because guess what? I was playing Pokemon Go at Pokemon Go Fest New York. I was literally in Manhattan all weekend, walking all of Manhattan from Friday to Sunday, playing Pokemon. I'm going to tell you, I think I caught like 44 Shinies all weekend. I got three Hundos. 
Um, I'm feeling pretty good about it. I didn't come close to some of the other people I was playing with. One guy in the group that I was with got at least 100 like shiny Pokemon, which is insane to me. I did get one mega or one shiny Rayquaza that I then mega evolved. I know this appeals to, I think, one listener of the show, but nonetheless, I appreciate you. So it was a good weekend. And then today and yesterday was the Pokemon Go Global Go Fest. So I think yesterday I got a 13 or 14 shinies a lot of pokemon that i didn't already have shinies for which is awesome um i got two hundos yesterday which is awesome pretty good weekend all overall after this show i'm gonna go walk around at my local park for another two hours to try to see if i can get anything else um and try to do as many raids as i possibly can because they removed the remote raid limit again this only appeals to like four people so i appreciate you listening but <laughs> otherwise it's been good um i gave myself like five different blisters on my feet because i decided huh these are brand new shoes let's definitely walk thirty thousand steps with them for three days each it's not a good idea but um yeah otherwise things have been good i've read a bunch of comics so when i was done playing pokemon after the weekend i basically sat down and got caught up on all of my shonen jump titles so i read all of one punch man all of one piece all of dragon ball super uh kaiju number eight those are like my mainstays um i've given up on my hero academia but the book that i want to talk about uh I've, paloma i saw you laugh maybe we should talk about this in the break uh <laughs> Uh, but I, the book I do want to talk about is Occulted. Uh, this is written by Amy Rose and Ryan Estrada with art by Zhang Min Lee. I talked a little bit about this on TikTok, and my interpretation of the book was that it was going to be kind of a funnier, goofier, good time of a book. Spoilers, it is not. It is a truish tale about growing up in a cult and the kind of insanity that comes from that, like the way that the leaders of cults manipulate the people that join these cults and how some people are completely blind to it and some people are aware of it but are unwilling to lose the like so social like benefits of being part of this group um and it, so it follows this girl amy rose it's in 1997 so it's a truish story about amy's life um she's forbidden to go to school or even going outside at all and the leader of this group says that there's no use of knowing anything outside of the world because it's about to end like it's very very similar to like heaven's gate and in fact the book opens up with this the news of the heaven's gate like terrible atrocities that happen with them if you're interested google it but you know content warning um Lots of lots of death, unfortunately. And yeah, so this is a really interesting book as we follow Amy's perseverance, despite all of the extremely unbelievable negativity thrown at her. Um, like her mom is sick and this leader of this group is trying to cure her with her quote unquote magic powers. Um, but she's clearly manipulating both her mom and Amy to think that the op either doesn't want to see each other or be around each other. Amy at one point goes to live with a completely different family and stays there for months and then eventually gets dragged back. Um, she learns about what cults are. It turns out she's a very like uh, she's a very voracious reader. And so anything she can get her hands on, she learns and she understands. But yeah, it's a pretty powerful book. I really, really liked it by the end because there's a lot of um levity despite the unfortunate and terrible situation that she's in like somehow amy managed to find like bright spots in a lot of darkness um so there's there's some fun bits in the book but overall it's a very almost like harrowing tale of what can happen to people that fall into this cult mentality so i, I really thought that was really cool um this is published by iron circus comics occulted definitely recommend it if you're looking for something kind of off the beaten path um the one thing i will say about the art here is it feels very like it reminds me of like, I don't, this is not an insult because these books are not bad, but it reminds me of Harlequin comics where mm. like it's a very, very like basic, basic manga style. Um, that doesn't mean that the book isn't detailed or pretty in a lot of moments, but there is kind of like the classic, like very like large eyes, very round faces, tiny mouths that you would see on like older manga. Um, but otherwise, like I said, really, really good read. I read it all in one sitting and was like blown away by it. So I definitely recommend it if you're looking for something weird. I was going to say, I, I, I just like the fact that at one point you were like, though, this this will be fun. This will this will be a this will be well, a nice slice of life. Easy. You book, know. No, no, no. See, I thought it was going to be about like weird occult cryptid stuff, because there's a joke about like, okay. was Mahatma Gandhi an alien? You know, are our animals like the strange animals in this world? Are they just cryptids? And it's like, no, those are all the lies that are being told by this cult to this little girl. Um, okay. And then it turns out things get a little bit darker. So you 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 thought you were getting like Mothman prophecies, and and instead you got like Heaven's Gate. I got exactly exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Speaking of really fun books that I'm sure are bright and happy to read, Nick, what else did you read this week? <laughs> sure, we'll we'll keep we'll keep on a on a tonally dark trend here. Um, <laughs> just very briefly, I will mention just because I read it, loved it, and definitely can't explain it uh, in any sort of way that I think would would impress anyone. Um, if you haven't read Miss Truesdale and the Fall of Hyperborea. Uh, this is a story by Mike Mignola, art and color by Jesse Lonergan, letters by Clem Robbins. Uh, you might remember a couple months back, I said, hey, this book kind of gets a little deep into the Hellboy lore, but ultimately that doesn't really matter. And if you're just looking for beautiful art, this is a wonderful showcase of what Jesse Lonergan can do, just albeit in like a Hellboy flavor. Issues, the final last issue of that, uh, no different. It's <laughs> The book is even more confusing even more trippy. Jesse awesome. Lonergan gets even more unhinged, which is ultimately exactly what I wanted with sort of his weird iconoclastic panel uh, layouts and organization. So yeah, if, you, if you're looking for just a beautiful book that will probably confuse you, go pick that up. Uh, the other books I did want to talk about, uh, much in line with what Mike was saying, is Alien 4 and 5. This is written by Declan Shalvey, art by Andrea Bricardo, colors by Ruth Redmond and Triona Farrell, and letters by Joe Caramanga. I had that fun moment with this book where I thought I just hadn't read issue five, and then I sat down and started reading and realized I never read issue four. So that was fun. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> and you're like, did I miss something? You did miss something. And honestly, there were things that I really liked about the first three issues of this book, you had to change in setting to like an Arctic planet. You kind of had a lighter and brighter art aesthetic that kind of fell outside of what um, Alien tends to be, which is what I call the high realism, low visibility look um, <laughs> that you sort of see in the films. <laughs> and and just sort of the fact that the makeup and relationship between the characters fell outside of the usual alien archetypes, a.k.a. hapless space truckers, hapless colonial marines and hapless frontier colonists uh you've got something a little different here uh that said uh, it's an alien story so you're always waiting for the part where someone like shines their flashlight into the shadowy corner of a cargo hold on a derelict Hell freighter yeah. only to find a cluster of eggs or you know someone's late for the crew's lunch only to find them in their bathroom slouched against the sink with the with the fluorescent light flickering on the ceiling and illuminating the face hugger on their face <laughs> right like that's that's what yes. you want that's yes. what i want that's the part you're looking for it's like i, I would compare it to christmas right cuz like <laughs> like christmas time right christmas carols are fine Decorating the tree is fine. People are okay with these things, but like really what you want to do is is open presents. <laughs> and and in Alien, it's not presents, it's rib cages. Uh and so that that's ultimately what you want. Um I'm not a sadist, okay? Sure. sure. But that's what you want. And and issues 4 and 5 just freaking deliver this holy shit. Like everything goes to pot, which it's an mm -hmm. Alien book. It is going to happen count them there are like five massive freaking twists in issue four alone i almost got mad at declan shelby because i was like these are all massive twists and you're just dumping them all on this issue and you're just not being economical like <laughs> you know <laughs> spread this out man um i don't want to get into these twists but i will say like they don't come out of nowhere sure. they're not deus ex machina bullshit like there are really good clues that you like when you, when it gets revealed you're like oh my god and you think back and you're like everything fits into place and it's even more genius because if you've read alien books you know that there are certain archetypes you know that there are different certain story beats that every single alien story seems mm -hmm. to hit and you look forward to them maybe and sometimes they're a little bit easier to see than not but in this book Declan pulls off some really clever, clever, some of them even subconsciously, I think, that I had to unpackage, little misdirects, these little, little misdirects that keep you off the trail of his reveals. And my gosh, like, so much fun. Ricardo's art is absolutely amazing. I can't wait for when this book comes back in November that they're keeping the art team intact. In fact, for people that are on the fence, it's supposed to carry over from this first mm. arc. 
Declan Shalvey is actually going to be splitting art duties Ooh. with Bricardo. That's yep. cool. Yep. Shalvey's going to do a narrative in the past while Bricardo is going to do a narrative in the present. So you got a past present narrative Sick. going on simultaneously. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to get an annual in October that's going to be a connective tissue between the two arcs. Nice. I can't wait to get caught up. Yeah. If you haven't started the Shalvey arc, it's really good. And I don't want to start shit here, but there's something about. <laughs> Go for it. The Brits, the 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 people in, in Great Britain, United Kingdom, United mm-hmm. Kingdom. Don't want to start that okay. shit. Oof, let me yeah, get this please. right. The people in the United Kingdom, the people that live in that area, the people that live in that area with Ireland and both of the Ireland's in England and Scotland. And um, I think that's all of them. I'm not going to get Nick, in trouble just, here. I'm not going to exclude please, anyone. Please, They know how to write Alien better than anyone else. Okay? I don't know what uh-huh. it is. Somehow, they tap into this better than American writers. I'm sorry. It's true. And and Declan is, is proof. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to get caught up on this. I, uh, I, I think I'm still... I think I'm one arc behind, but that's that's neither here nor there. I'm going to talk about one more book, and then I'm going to pitch it over to Paloma to talk about one more book, and then we're going to get to the top of our pile on what feels like it's going to be the longest episode of IRCB ever, um, <laughs> looking at our clock. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Dark X-Men number one. This is by Steve Fox, Jonas Scarf, uh, for colors by Frank Martin, letters by Clayton Coles. Um, honestly, this book is dumb as hell, like straight up dumb as hell. I'm so mad about the fall of X. Anyone who's reading X-Men books knows that the end is coming. I'm very upset. I wanted another like two years of X-Men in in prosperity, but whatever. I'm going to say this is all Kieran Gillen's fault because I feel like he orchestrated it. Um, but that's OK. Uh, uh, but this book, dumb as hell. I absolutely loved it. There's nothing better in this world than watching Alex Summers, a.k.a. Havoc, get knocked around as a lovesick puppy by the clone of his brother's wife, a.k.a. Madeline Pryor. Um, if none of that makes any sense, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to tell you, but that's just what it is. The conceit of this book, though, is really bonkers, right? Like Limbo, the place in hell where wayward souls and demons dwell, has created an embassy in the regular world. Like a a demon hole opened up (laughs) and a big old building is now just like in the middle of a place. Um, I don't think it's really defined where. Maybe I missed that, but it doesn't matter because... A bunch of evil mutants who have been basically banished to hell um, or are kind of on the outskirts of the law and were not sent to the to the chopping block with the Hellfire Gala. That's as much as I'm going to say there are now in this building. And Alex Summers is seemingly the only person who thinks that he needs to corral them. Meanwhile, Madeline Pryor, who is kind of leading this whole organization because a while ago, Magic, uh, who is Colossus's sister, um, who's on the X-Men team, basically gave limbo to madeline Pryor. she's the goblin queen now now she's the head of controlling all of limbo and fighting back all the demons um so she's kind of still the head of this organization and she's making all sorts of weird deals left and right and alex is like i can't keep up with this but i love you so much like there's so many panels in this book where he's just making these this dumb puppy dog face to her and she's just like slapping him about um metaphorically there's no there's no domestic abuse in this book but still it's really goofy and uh then all of a sudden when push comes to shove and suddenly there needs to be x-men doing something madeline Pryor says well i'll take a bunch of my evil dudes uh, and alex summers and i'll lead a team to try to stop people and the end of this book had me laughing my ass off and quite honestly did not think that this book was going to be any good and it turns out it's my favorite new book that's come out of the fall of x um x-men 23 was or excuse me x-men 25 was really really good but dark x-men number one amazing like i think those two books have really set the bar to okay mike it's going to be okay you're going to get over this like i'm in stage two of the five stages i think that's grief i don't know um but i'm i'm settling down with the idea that maybe krakoa is no more um but the other fall of x books have not rubbed me the right way so i'm glad that we got x-men 25 and this dark x-men number one um that seemed to be leading the pack in like the fall of x is going to be fun and exciting so let's let's see what can happen here so yeah, I, didn't, I don't want to ask any questions about the X-Men, so we're just going to move on from there to Paloma. What was the last book you read before we get to the top of our pile? <laughs> All right, last book I read for this week, I picked up Godzilla War for Humanity number one, written by Andrew McLean, um, art by Jake Smith and published by IDW. 
And we follow Dr. Yuko Honda, who as a girl was being chased by one of the kaiju, Hidora, and none other than Godzilla saved her. And so she's like a kaiju expert now, has a TED talk and all that jazz, and she gets recruited by like a secret like governmental organization to stop this new big bad kaiju that I think is just made up of a bunch of pollution and gunk. And so I'm excited to see where that goes. Oh, and she like has faith in Godzilla, but Godzilla right now is on Kaiju Island or whatever the heck it's called. I don't I don't know Godzilla <laughs> lore. So um, <laughs> I'm really excited to see where it goes. The art, um, Jake Smith art is like super expressive and unique. I love seeing that in the pages of comics. And Andrew McLean is the writer and artist of Headlopper. So that's really why I picked up this book. Mm, Having a great okay. time. Again, I don't know much about Godzilla or Kaiju, but I loved this. That I feel like there are very few Godzilla comics out there that require you to know the lore, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> hell, I think there's there's plenty of Godzilla movies out there that don't require you to lo- to know the lore. So. <laughs> <laughs> this looks really cool though. I remember seeing like this on somewhere league of comic geeks probably um just as a promo and the art looks really cool mm-hmm. like jake smith's art is really fun so you have to keep up on this and let me know how it is because maybe this will be like a trade that i grab in the future um looks kind of fun um but let's uh, let's move on to things let's move on to books on the top of our pile whether they're new they're old or just a book you've been trying to read and now you're finally sitting down to do that Let's talk about comics. I guess we'll shout out to the folks that are hanging out with us on Discord. Danny is going to be reading the Batman slash Catwoman Gotham War Battle Lines book. I can't believe that that's the name of a title, but you know what? (laughs) Whatever it is, it sounds like it's a Batman's fan's dream. Um, I also want to shout out that the Devil's Cut number one is coming out this week, and I'm curious to know if anyone's actually reading it or buying this to read it or if they're just like buying it in a bad idea kind of way so that they can hawk it on eBay. I'm curious. Send me an email. Mm-hmm. ircbpodcast at gmail.com <laughs> um but nick what are you uh what's on the top of your pile this week um yeah for me it's got to be uh the hunger and the dusk number two i feel like this is a book that has gotten deservedly a lot of attention within the last month or two um everybody feels it seems like everybody's in like a dark fantasy mood right now i don't know if that's because of you know, Baldur's Gate 3 or Diablo 4 or or what what's going on, but everybody seems to be in that mood right now. But this is the book from writer G. Willow Wilson, art by Christian uh, Wild Goose. Not really 100% sure what the fate of this book is. I know some people are aware, but for those who aren't, within the last month, there's been some stories about IDW since their recent what happened? They layoffs that they did, right? Lay, yeah, right. They did a massive set of layoffs, and and that of course impacted the company. And uh, the word was that some of the IDW originals were going to get canceled, and some of them were looking for new homes. And it's just kind of, at least from what I heard, just a little case by case and up in the air at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope and would like to think that this book will somehow find it out to the other side, um, but I guess we'll have to wait and see um which this is really too bad i thought idw's original series largely most of the stuff i've read from that like um what was it kevin scott's book dead shores or dead whatever mm-hmm. like the 70s pulpy one about ghosts on a ship or um earth divers mm-hmm. like i've um i think uh, jesse lonergan's arca might have also been part of that yep i think so just some really wonderful stuff and uh, it's it's unfortunate to see that you know, some of this is now up in the air or just dead altogether. But um, yeah, I, I hope this book, I know some books from this, from IDW's originals line got canceled. Um, yeah. but I feel like I hope that G. Willow Wilson and, and uh, Christian Wild are able to finish this because I really, really like that first mm-hmm. issue. So I'm hoping that they at least get to get to a good conclusion of some kind, or maybe they can pick this up and move it over to another publisher if that's a thing. I don't know how much of the ownership they have. I know the originals lines at all the different publishers are very much like IP grabby. So yeah, I don't know. I I think the, so. Take this with a grain of salt. Um, I think the bleeding cool article I read. So go ahead, sure. several teaspoons of salt. Um, mentioned that they were in the process of trying to or they were planning to give back to you know creators their own works and then let them sort out what they want to do so Hmm. uh, hopefully maybe this can find a home at like 
I mean, this seems like like a real no brainer for like image or image shadow line. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. If anything else, so yeah, fingers crossed. Cool. Uh, well, for me, I am looking forward to reading a book that's been on my shelf for a minute called Catboy. This is written and drawn by Benji Nate. Uh, you may remember me of talking about Benji Nate's latest book, Girl Juice, that came out pretty recently, uh, either here or on TikTok. Um, and Girl Juice is probably the funniest book I've read all year, and that is saying a lot. I feel like I've read a lot of very funny comic books this year. Girl Juice still has some of the funniest panels that I think about. Um, or just, I'm like, that is absolutely absurd. I can't believe this is in a book and it's so funny. Um, and a Megan Mog book came out this year, you know, that's like, it's up there. So, um, but the synopsis for this book is Olive is a human and Henry is her pet cat. Although he's also a person, thanks to a magical shooting star, they do all the things best friends do like share clothes, go to parties and complain about their jobs. Who cares if Henry gets more compliments wearing Olive's clothes or the party snacks or dead rats. Friends love each other no matter what. And I, I think this is just going to be another very kind of like goofy, absurd, book about friends that's like in a fake slice of life story and um i'm very much looking forward to it um plus benji nate's art is very fun and uh just a just a cool book overall so if you get a chance definitely recommend uh either cat boy or girl juice i haven't even read cat boy i'm recommend it. i know that it's going to be good but girl juice probably one of the funniest books you can read uh paloma what about you what are you excited for i've been also kind of like going back into time and picking up some classics i just grabbed the essential dykes to watch out for by allison bechtel i mostly picked it up because other people um other like my friends are reading it and i was like oh i i better get good i i have a girlfriend and partake (laughs) in the culture i better read this finally Uh uh-huh so yeah I'm, i'm pretty stoked just follow i think it's published from like 83 to 2008 so quite a span of time so Mm. Like there's political talk, social talk, and from what I've like been reading so far, uh, still kind of like re- like it doesn't feel dated, which is nice. Nice, yeah. I feel like this is one of those books that people say, you know, after you finish finish Fun Home, pick up the rest of Bechdel's work, mm-hmm. and like this is right up there. Um, so cool. I'll, maybe I'll have to give this a read if if you're saying it's good. I I mean, I trust Bechdel with everything at this right? point, right? Um, Well, cool. Well, let's uh, take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the commissioned episode that we have. A fan of the show at the $10 commission asked us to talk about opposable plagiarism. And we've got a whole definition and a bunch of context for that. So when we come back, we're going to dig into that. For our show this week, we are talking a commissioned episode topic. The topic, I'm going to just read it as is and then maybe go into some of the discussion we had about it. Opposable plagiarism. A literature teacher once told me that Hamlet was a derivative ripoff of a play called The Spanish Prince, but no one remembers The Spanish Prince because it was boring and poorly written. Now, I never Googled that, but I never forgot it either. So my idea for a show is this. If there are no new ideas, is there a formula for determining if classic or an old idea has been improved upon or insulted? Explorations of revisions, reboots, or reimaginings in comics. Um, And I think as comic fans, we are very, 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 very familiar with the idea of a reboot or reimagining or an altered state of a character that we already know all the definitions for. But I think comics in specific, right? Like this is a this is definitely an idea in literature, a retelling or an allegory or an homage. But I think in comics in particular, it's very interesting because every five, six years, we get a retelling of a new of the same character over and over and over or a slight variation on that character. So Paloma, Nick, you were requested to be on this episode with me, um, which is what makes these commissioned episodes on our Patreon so interesting for anyone out there. If you're interested, I think we have three slots open right now for commissioned episodes it's at patreon.com slash IRCB podcast. So let's dig into the discussion. Um, I guess, Paloma, let me kick this over to you. Uh, when you saw this topic, I guess, what were some of the first thoughts you had going into it? I thought it was a really great topic, kind of like the crux of the big two, right? You're always totally. rebooting, always reimagining. I'm a big superhero comics fan. And sometimes the rebooting like bogs me bogs me down or the retellings. Like mm-hmm. Batman's one of my all-time favorite characters. I'm reading a million billion Batman stories, but he's also he's someone at the mercy of a retelling or like a revisiting and i feel like every time there's like a new 
story arc or like a new writer, like we see like five pages worth of like the Wayne's demise. <laughs> Pearls. <laughs> yes. My mother. <laughs> Yes, I totally get that. The thing I, I kind of wonder about that is, you know, we're so used to it. Um, it is a it's like a reference to a reference of itself. Do you think that that like takes away from the comic when we see this almost near constant retelling of Batman's origin? I know I read the Tom King run of Batman just because I was like, oh, look, it's Tom King. Every other issue, he was like, my mother and father died at a theater. I was like, no shit, dude. I read the last two issues. You so <laughs> told me that two issues ago. Um but why did why do you think it still works in comics versus maybe other mediums? Like if you watch the TV show and every season they were like, by the way, origin story, by the way, origin story, uh, it might feel repetitive, but comics is somehow manages to get away with that. Why do you think that is? Oh, that's good. I can gloss over f- like the panels to a degree. Okay. But maybe in a less jaded sense, it packs it packs a punch because we've seen it so many times. Like we True. we never forget that the pearls were there. We never forget like the imagery of like Spider Man holding like Uncle Ben, right? Mm-hmm. I think even mm-hmm. though we're seeing it all the time, we have an attachment to these characters where it can work. Like I'll say seventy five percent of the time. Sure, sure. I mean, Nick, feel free to jump in here. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I know Batman is the one that we keep harping on, but I think like, you know, Superman landing on Earth or uh, the Flash, I don't know, getting water spilled on him. I don't know what the origin story is at this point. (laughs) I don't remember. (laughs) Um, But still, like, I don't even know. A lot of these characters, you know, they, they have this this thing. And I feel like maybe this leans more into DC than Marvel, right? I think with the exception of like when a new spider person gets... Uh, unveiled maybe we get a different origin story but i feel like with dc characters they're really always talking about their origins or maybe that's just my perception given how few i've read um so nick i don't know what are what are your thoughts here why do you think that this like constant retelling of these characters backstories works in comics maybe not so much in other mediums yeah well as someone who really doesn't read much big two as a caveat that said um i think you're right uh it certainly does feel like DC wants to tell these stories over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to wade into that. Um, I, I think in terms of, but that's why we're here. From Nick. a more, <laughs> yeah, right. I know. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to participate in this episode. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Who, sorry, commissioner. This sorry episode. about that. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm not feeling it. I'm just going to log off. Um, no, I, I think from a real, I just, I guess just, basic level i i think the reason you do see a lot of origin story retelling is just the simple fact that um comics uh i mean <laughs> let me be clear comics take a lot of work to make and they require a lot of care and a lot of care goes into them but compared to a film compared to a tv show compared to writing a whole novel um we're talking about creating like 22 pages and the, the the turnaround time to create a comic is just so immeasurably small compared to so many other mediums that the just sheer act of creating another origin story or redoing an origin story is just so much easier. So sure. just on a basic level, I think that that's certainly part of it. And then if you want to get real cynical about it, certainly origin stories and 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 renumberings tend to go hand in hand well uh, we can we can let's let's skip but aside, not always but let's skip right? aside the the business side of things right like renumbering yeah, yeah, yeah. reboots whatever that is a selling point but yet sure. we as readers still are okay with it right and why well, does and, it work and, and more that's, here right and i think that's sort of the question of where the business side and the creator side and the reader side kind of collide which is the publisher continues the publishers and the editors continue to do this But the only reason I think that they're able to continue doing it is because readers are receptive to it. Sure. So then it becomes a question of, well, why are readers receptive to this over and over again? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it Stockholm Syndrome? I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) But uh, (laughs) have we been conditioned? Maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe. I mean, maybe, maybe this is part of Mike's cult book. I don't know. Sure. But certainly readers seem to want this and i i don't know i i think part of it from like a anthropological 
viewpoint would be that these sort of origin stories, these retellings are almost ritualistic and uh, in the sense that they're repetitive or that they um, sometimes maybe don't vary that much from one another or there are certain beats that have to be hit. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, whether it's the pearls or whether it's, you know, Uncle Ben has to die. Right. Um, that, you know, these are ritual retellings of narratives and, and as rituals, you know, they have to have certain things happen. You know, you have to repeat the process in a certain way and certain things have to occur for the ritual to take place to retell the narrative. And so I think, I think that that's, I mean, I mean look guys, I took like anthropology 101 a bajillion years ago, but <laughs> this is good. I just think you really need to see the new Spider-Man movie. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I know I Nick seen any of them. I know, I yeah. know, I know, Nick. We we don't have to get you on your high horse about having not seen the superhero I, I'm movies. Not, I'm, I'm just not, don't, um, yeah. but I think it's funny that you say that though, because that idea that you just talked about is actually at the core of the latest into the Spider-Verse movie, right? The new animated mm -hmm. Spider-Man movie. So what you're saying is they stole the idea. They yes. stole you they they stole the idea. They stole the idea of storytelling. Yes. <laughs> um <laughs> from me. From Nick. You're forgetting that part. Um, from me. Um, yes, they reach into the future. Philip and Lord, they reach into the future, plop this idea out of your head and put it into their movie when they started writing it six years ago. Man, fuck those I guys. <laughs> I felt so bad when they got taken off a of solo and I I, I I really argued their case. And you know what? They didn't have my back. Fuck those two. Well, okay. Hear me out Fucking though. Lego so movie. what's interesting about this this idea here is that like I think you know we can talk about reboots and reorigins, but there's this question I think that was at the center of the 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 the, the topic itself, which is is there a formula for success mm -hmm. in comics? Um, and I think we can maybe if we start to zoom out at a ten thousand foot view, you can go yeah. If you do a hero's journey. Probably if you execute it well, it'll go well, you know, and there's a bunch of these ideas of like what creates conflict and narrative Tia added some notes when we were talking about this a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago when we were um, arguing or not arguing, we we're trying to figure out like what we wanted to do and how we wanted to approach this topic. Um, and Tia kind of pointed out this idea of the conflict and narrative of like man versus man, man versus self, man versus nature. Um, these types of story archetypes exist. But if we drill in a little bit further you know, beyond like these very high level story beats, do you think that there is a formula um, in comics or for maybe a specific kind of comic um, that does well over others? Or like, is there is there room for experimentation? Or do you think formula is the only success here? I'm like, trying to get some hot takes out of you guys. So you don't have to caveat yeah. everything. I'm just like, throwing it out there. So Paloma, I don't know, what are your thoughts here? I do think formula can lead, like formula leads to success, ultimately. Um, sure. and I'll use like my one anecdotal like reference point is DC comics, new 52. They try to do mm -hmm. some different, different things, reimaginings of characters. Superman had no briefs on his uniform. And I honestly <laughs> forgot his origin, but I feel like he did not meet the Kents or he was a real like sourpuss so he uh -huh. he's not our usual farm boy i thought that was not a good comic did not like his characterization but they were doing trying to do something different mm -hmm. wonder woman from that same new 52 completely like changed her origin and kind of like lost her like the heart of her were like queen hippolyta i can't remember her name made her from clay but now she's like new 52 born from gods which Mm -hmm. messes up her whole vibe her like core element batman right. however if i'm remembering correctly he stayed the same and right. it was one of my favorite runs for like a good while mm -hmm. and they did not break the mold with batman but they tried something new and different with the other two of like the trinity and i felt like it was bad news bears i i don't feel like it had critical praise and i did not like it as a fan Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I totally feel that from like of those three stories, I've read all of them. I tried them all. And Batman was the only one I stuck with. Right. Um, I guess to DC's defense, if you try to take down the three tent poles that you have, the whole circus <laughs> falls. Right. So they had to keep one up. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I do feel that like keeping Batman's kind of formulaic storytelling, the way that he does things um, allowed for that book to be successful. I mean, Scott Snyder 
pretty pretty great mm-hmm. writer. I mean, I think on the whole, um, he's had his ups and downs depending on his books. But that Batman run is pretty notorious for being very, very good, reusing a lot of the elements that I think make the Batman series great, um, twisting them a little bit, but still following all of the tropes, right? Whereas the Superman run, the Wonder Woman run, um, even you think of like Swamp Thing, you yeah. know, like weird takes on those characters, some of them more successful than others. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's it's weird to think that like tweaking the formula on some of those characters might have worked like Animal Man. What was Animal Man before the new 52? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that was a pretty fantastic run that Lemire had. Um, but maybe the formula for, for Animal Man just didn't work before. Right. How else are you going to do a guy who's got animal powers? It's kind of a, a dorky power in c- comparison to everybody else. Um, but I, I totally feel like the formula for Batman worked and allow that book to be successful. Uh, Nick, you you were a pretty big fan of that run too, right? I don't know. How do you feel about that that assessment? Yeah. I mean, Animal Man was, was interesting as well because it's not like that was the first time, right, that DC was like, man, I, I don't know what to fucking do with this guy, mm-hmm, right? Because mm-hmm. obviously that was the feeling at DC when Grant Morrison was handed the character, right, back mm-hmm. in the 80s, 80s and 90s. And at that point, they were like, ugh, I really don't fucking know what to do with that guy. And I think that's part <laughs> of it is that... If like with Animal Man, it's just the idea that you sort of d- dig him up every twenty years and hand him to some sort of like cool outlaw, you know, leather jacket <laughs> wearing fellow, or in the case of Jeff Lemire, you know, uh, hockey stick uh, toting guy, yeah, hockey stick, you know, wearing flannel wearing Canadian, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and and see what sort of sadness comes out of the book, but um, uh. Yeah, I, I, I think if there's sort of a metric for success, I think to some level it's giving people, I, I guess what I would call a, a variation on a theme, right? It's um delivering something that's both familiar and unfamiliar at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the trickier things when thinking about this idea of like what makes a a book of success versus just a, a derivative, I don't know what you want to call it, like a superfluous cash grab, I guess, right? And now all I can think of is the the Tim, uh, the stupid, what's what's the I think you should leave guy's name? Uh, Tim. Tim Robbins? Uh, Robinson? Tim Robbins, his his whole cash grab rant with, with Tim Heidecker. So that's, yeah. that, that reference will appeal to three people. Yeah. Um, but... I, I, I was thinking about this idea of with comics, you have obviously, you know, art and prose for those who are unaware. And if if that's where you are with comics, congratulations. Uh, you know, we're not going to gatekeep. Uh, sure. You're more than welcome to join. Um, but I was thinking about. Can can we consider a work, a remake or, or a revisiting of something a success if the if we consider the prose part to be just derivative, but we really like the art or vice versa, like, is that enough to really consider something like a worthwhile remake, right? Like if somebody basically redoes Superman's origin story and they do it beat for beat narratively, and we see the same things happen and we encounter the same sort of characters and the same sort of struggles happen, but it's just a different artist and it's a different artist that we like do we consider that enough of a shift to call that work like truly, I don't know what you want to call it, like a, you know, like an original a great work. new take, a truly original work, right? Right. Sure. Like I was thinking about this and in, in the same vein, like how do we feel about, and I don't know if this is shifting too far outside of the purview of the, the, the question. So feel free to redirect. Um, when when we have just classic prose works that just flat out get adapted, right? Um, hmm. Like uh, Junji Ito's Frankenstein, right? Like, do we consider that to be like a truly great new, um, you know, piece of art, or is it in some way just derivative from the fact that it is strictly an adaptation? I I don't know. Same thing with uh, Lovecraft's manga adaptations. I was right. thinking kind of in the same boat, like. How do we navigate those? But yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing because like 
there there's this idea that like on paper sounds really cool of like let's take yeah. one perfect script and give it to 12 different artists and see how they interpret oh, no. it right and then that kickstarter would just marginally get over the top um and it would probably be just an okay anthology um but i like that idea um the question is like are those individual independent works like is interpretation of a script like considered enough to be like a change in in the storytelling beats i mean i think so right i think the way that an artist conveys action and the way they convey how people are positioned on a page and like panel layout and all that other stuff definitely changes the narrative can add inflection and emotion and all sorts of feelings Hmm, towards um a character or a story that you may not have felt right like one person may interpret the story of someone who goes to walk their dog they lose their dog they can't find them and then they're sad in a pleasant little way because maybe at the end they add in their own little bits of like oh the dog was just hiding but that wasn't necessarily in the script because the artist's interpretation is that this is a happy story whereas another person like a junji ito might say no the dog turned into an all-consuming world devourer and the last page is the dog swallowing up the world right like I don't know, but that interpretation of the work, I think it, it's saying, it, I guess the idea here is that artists get a little bit of leeway in how a story is conveyed to the reader, right? Like a person who writes something down is not the sole cl- collaborator and creator of a vision for a book, right? It is that person who creates the art that in my mind kind of gets the final say in how that story is interpreted. And usually writers and artists will collaborate to make sure that the vision that they share is, is equal or at least going the same direction. But if you were to blindly say, I'm going to write a script, give it to 12 artists, no interpretation or no direction beyond what they get in the script, then it's up to the artist to kind of tell that story. So like, to go back to your example of Frankenstein, right? That's Junji Ito's interpretation of the visual style of Frankenstein and how that's portrayed with the inspiration coming from this open body of work that is the Frankenstein story, um, which is going to be a very, very different story if given to say like, uh, I don't know, like a a Ryan Brown, right? Who's probably going to take a more comedic (laughs) bent on that and make Frankenstein this goofy cartoon character versus Junji Ito's like horrifying monster. So again, I think there is a lot of weight. Um, And we've maybe gotten a little bit away from the topic here, but I think that that like, I don't want to discredit the interpretation of an artist to be any less than that, like the written piece coming from a writer, right? Right. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I don't know. I I guess like that. And that's where I think like the collaboration piece is super crucial when it comes to telling stories, taking formula, quote unquote, in heavy quotes here, formula for a story to say, we're going to do a new Batman origin. How are we going to interpret it? How horrific is the death of the Waynes going to be? How how torn up is Bruce actually going to be by that? Right. Like that interpretation, of that story. We know the beats. We know Batman or Bruce Wayne is a young kid, sees his parents die, realizes that he has to find justice um, for their murder, grows up and eventually does this thing, right? Like if you look at all the various Batman films, we've gotten at least some version of that. Even in the the Matt Reeves Batman, we at least know that it happened. Um, And the way that those different Bat people have taken and interpreted it is a bit different, right? The Nolan's Batman, it's very militaristic. In the, the Matt Reeves Batman, it's very like doom and gloom street fighting right if you go back all the way to the tim burton book it's very cartoony um so like is are all of those formula the same i sort of but are they at different ver- degrees of success i also think that that's true so um you can also call out a dozen different batman origin stories in the comics right like the frank miller batman origin story compared to the scott snyder compared to all the way back in the 30s whatever that batman origin story was which i'm sure if we read it in comparison would be a drastically different take um in general um but that's just i don't know it's it's a formula that works which kind of answers the question in my mind of like is it all just formulas and i think kind of but i think that's also like nostalgia um i'm gonna stop talking so one of you can jump in here but i'd love to hear your thoughts on any or all of those points <laughs> um to your like point mike of how there's like different like there's like the frank miller version of the origin uh like all the different movies had different like origins for batman right and these characters i feel like these different origins then lead to like different strains of these like characters where people are like Mm -hmm. i like my batman brooding or like i like my batman as like a family man so it's and i like mine just more (laughs) yes (laughs) yeah and so 
then you'll have these different strains that then like like a writer will take like one of the different versions of Batman, maybe like the more brooding emo one and get like a cool prolific writer, but it's not well received because maybe we're in an era where like, that's not my Batman. Sure, sure. So we get like new kind of like archetypes of these characters and it's just kind of like a waiting game of like, I'm not going to read the current Batman run right now because I don't like my Batman this way. Yeah. Which I, I think kind of lends to the question of like, if there are no new ideas, is there a formula for determining the classic or an old idea has been improved upon, right? Like, I think we, we've we taken this idea, like to just keep harping on this Batman idea, but like we've taken this very old idea of a Batman and we've kind of made it work within the confines of these beats that we have for the character, but to fit a specific era or readership um, to improve upon it, I think to say, let's make this work for the common reader now. And then in a few years, maybe that common reader has changed and wants more of a happy-go-lucky Batman. And that's how we get like a Nightwing Batman, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, I think that that's, that's important because at, at a certain point in storytelling, right, the story leaves the author's hands and becomes a part of the people, right? This is kind of that whole thing of like Star Wars no re- doesn't really belong to Disney. It really belongs to the fans who have kept it alive and keep breathing life into it over the years and yes i know disney is control the ip listen papa walt i understand like i'm not trying to say that i own star wars please don't sue me into oblivion but i also think that like had there not been persistent love for a series like that it wouldn't even be popular to this day same with batman same with spider-man right like readers are readers love this type of formula but also interpret it in their own way to where they get to in- inject their own thoughts into it when they read it but i don't know maybe that goes into like a totally different um discussion about stories and things like that so i don't know um i'm curious though about like when we talk about things like reboots or re- reimaginings um is there like a a a bridge too far that can be taken for some characters or do you think it's just a matter of like to your point, Paloma, of like readership, like there just needs to be the right audience for that story to work. Um, I don't know. I feel like I feel like it has to be the right audience or like the right timing for certain things. I know, like we'll go to Spider Man for example. I feel like in the current Amazing Spider Man run, Peter Parker is just having the worst days of his life, mm-hmm. and like. Peter, like, doesn't often win, but he's not, like, miserable. Like, we typically see him. Like, part of the Spider-Man formula is that his life is hard, but, like, at least there's, like, fun to be had. And I think right now Mm -hmm. he's in a very dark place. Maybe a lot of people that read Spider-Man aren't having the best time in 2023. Mm -hmm. So I feel like characters that often folks, like, can see themselves in, like, Peter's kind of probably a normal guy, or at least he's a dweeb, right? Mm -hmm. Um, When, like, the relatable characters kind of break out of, like, the relatable trope, or at least they're, like, relatable characteristic, I think then readership kind of, like, maybe loses focus and no longer Mm -hmm. are into, like, the current run or something. Interesting. Yeah, I'd be curious to see if there's some diehard Spider-Man fans out there um, that maybe have thoughts on this. Um, you know, send us an email. Um, I'd be because I, I haven't read Spider-Man in a minute. I feel like the last time I did read it, Spider-Man Peter Parker was in a bad spot, and I was just like, I don't know if I can deal with this on top of everything else, right? right? Uh, which is part of the reason why X-Men puts me off sometimes, right? Is they like they get into such dire spots. Like I'm, I'm dreading this fall of X stuff because like. We had a minute of like X-Men prosperity and I kind of liked that. And now we're falling back into this holy smokes, everyone hates us and humans have gotten the upper hand on us and all this other. And I'm just like, "Ah, that's just one more thing for me to be like, oh, damn, and feel stressed about, even though it's supposed to be a book that I'm like reading and enjoying, (laughs) Um, which is interesting because like, I guess if we start to get away from these like solo characters and these like maybe big two characters, I'm wondering if like when we look at this idea of formulas and stories and we look at this idea of like um reimaginings of existing stories retold through a slightly different lens right like we talked about westerns earlier hitting on all of these different tropes and like the the and the enfield gang massacre um do we still feel like do we feel like there's a a, a 
series of beats that need to be followed for that in order to a book like for a book like that to be successful? Or is it just a matter of like crafting the right kind of narrative around an idea and knowing that like the 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 scene and the like maybe like the theme of the book um will be able to carry some of that. I don't know. Um like Enfield Gang Massacre is a great example. Uh I, I think like The Weatherman if you guys read that book over at image is a, is a curious book because like, yeah, what is the story there? What is the, the trope or the formula that they're following? I feel like that book maybe wasn't as successful it wanted to be. So maybe where was the falling um, for that type of book compared to say like a saga, like what makes saga work so well in comparison to other books outside of the fact that Brian K. Vaughn and Fiona Staples are superstars. Um, but is it just superstardom that is driving a book like that? Yeah. Well, I think, as someone who is not 100% current on Saga, caveat number one sure. and caveat number two, uh, and I'm not trying to be a freaking edgelord here, okay? But okay. Saga is fine. Saga is fine. Sure. I don't, I don't worship it. I don't own five different iterations of it, you know? But for me, it's, it's, it's fine. It's good. Um, and I think, I think the reason that book worked when it kicked off was just the fact that it's a wholly seemingly, I say wholly original, despite the fact that we're discussing the idea that like no real idea is original. Right. But it felt like a fresh soap sci-fi soap opera at a time when at least to me, thinking back on what 2011, 2012, yeah. um, That we didn't really have something like that. And at least to me, it feels like when there's a genre that hasn't reached that point of just full tilt overexposure in pop culture, when people are just happy to see anything from that genre altogether, I think there's just sort of a willingness and maybe even a a wishing for maybe what is complete and total familiarity. Like we want something to just show up and hit the beats that we know and deliver on whatever genre staples or stereotypes um, or just just familiar tropes that we want to see. Mm-hmm. And so in the same vein, when I look at um, the Enfield gang massacre, right, I feel like Westerns are also at a point, not only in comics, but also in just pop culture broadly. Although I think you could argue that in some ways that like Yellowstone and Joe Pickett and other things like that are bringing it back. But we're certainly not at a point where the Western is like largely popular again. Sure, sure. Um, that people are just really happy, people who want to see Westerns, people are just largely happy to see anything that they're okay with the fact that it might just not really break or defy from the sorts of ideas that they know about that genre yeah interesting Um, interesting and and that's just my take on like the western like yeah the idea that he's like a you know an old outlaw and he's on the way out and he's trying to go straight Mm -hmm. right like these are like clearly western tropes Mm -hmm. but i i so rarely get to read westerns anymore that i just willingly you know i'm i invite it to be what it is uh, I'm okay with that. Sure. I, I like that notion that you're you're putting out here that sometimes culture is clamoring for a specific genre in comics in specific. Like, I think yeah. what's funny is that, like, you look at prose um, and every genre probably has an availability of some kind. Now, it's it probably ebbs and flows in the same way, but I feel like there is a prolification like in a larger scale for for prose to mm-hmm. hit all these genres, right? Like romance, I think, is a huge missing chunk in western comics right we don't have a lot of romance and i think if the right romance book came out because like i think a couple creators have tried and have not succeeded but if the right kind of romance book came out could be massively successful because clearly romance is in grossly like successful in prose right like to the point where like barnes and noble and amazon all these major book publishers and and sellers have dedicated entire chunks of their storefronts just to romance because so many people want different takes on that genre. Um, I think like, it's just, it's like you said, the Western is starting to become like a bigger want and thing in the comics. That's why we're seeing more of it. And like, it's allowed to follow those tropes. I really like that idea um, a lot. I don't know, Paloma, if you had any, any thoughts on that as well, but I'd be curious to hear them if you do. 
I also really like that idea of Nick's. Um, yeah, I liked and like the Enfield Gang Massacre because I just hadn't seen a lot of westerns, or they were like westerns, but like with a sci-fi skin, which is cool. But it wasn't <laughs> yeah, um, right set in the real world, and I that's kind of like where it starts, right? I I think it like ebbs and flows, or maybe to like the saga point. Saga was gone for five million years. People forgot about like people admittedly forgot <laughs> yeah, about basically. it, right? If that was like yeah, the only yeah. comic you were reading, maybe you forgot. And I feel like now we're seeing maybe more of a a rise in like the saga esque book. Like Black Cloak, for example, one of its big pitches mm. was that it's like the next like the next saga, like great for saga. Mm-hmm. Love that book. Feels very different, but it's also like here's a pair. One of them isn't is maybe like part of like a group that's being like ostracized, right? Mm-hmm. And that book I f- I felt worked really really well because like yes, it w- it was a very unique sci fi story, like Saga, I guess. But the the thing that makes that book interesting, not to completely cut you off here, but is that. When you start to pull at the strings of that book, you notice that it is just like a a, a very straightforward mm-hmm. mystery mm-hmm. with like a I'm a special person at the center <laughs> yes. of it, right? Um, like not to spoil everything, I think we should everyone should go read that book because Black Cloak is maybe one of the best books that Image is publishing right now. But like the story is just a pretty black and white mystery caper that has like this through line thread of like what is was it what is it about the this one character that is really going to change things and i i love that about that book mm-hmm. um but again is kelly thompson just following a formula with her book to make that into something successful um i don't know i don't i i will i, I can't really answer that because i'm not like a, a literature scholar person but i'm a guy that reads a lot of comic books so i don't know <laughs> I I think what's also interesting, sort of as the opposite end of the kind of Western spectrum I've I've been talking about, is that if you look at something like, um, let's say like Walking Dead, you know, Walking Dead arrives, and a couple years later, everybody loves and wants zombies, blah blah blah, mm-hmm. forever. Mm-hmm. It's becomes a pop culture mainstay and whatnot. And I think, again, back to that idea of like familiarity breeds contempt at least sometimes um i think certainly a couple years after walking dead people started looking at some of the books coming out a lot more critically and so if you looked like you were a zombie book everyone was like is it like walking dead is it not is it just a knockoff oh look it's another walking dead book um is this book just a cash grab this book is unoriginal right because uh, you know everything gets viewed in context and so people started churning out stuff that kind of looked like Walking Dead. And after several years of people clamoring for zombie stuff, everyone was pretty critical, right? Because they had been reading a lot of this stuff and maybe at the beginning they wanted it. And after a certain point, they're like, okay, had enough. Um, And so you reach a point where you start to look at things much more critically in the context of everything else that's sort of come out in the years before Mm -hmm, it. mm -hmm. And so I think that this idea of like originality is sort of obviously context sensitive, but also kind of depends on like, where are you showing up relative to the cultural trend, right? Are you showing up at the beginning? Are you the one inciting it? Or are you the one that's showing up two to three years later? And everyone's like, uh, are you just trying to cash in? Right. Right. So. Right. 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 Do you have an original zombie idea or is it just because, right? I get that. I, I right. feel like I was one of those readers, right? Where I was like, oh my God, I, if this book has zombies in it, I'm dropping it. I'm done with it. I'm not doing it. Um, I mean, like, there's only so many tropes that you can hit on in a zombie book before it's just like okay there's going to be a person that gets bit and doesn't tell anybody there's going to be a person that like gets killed unexpectedly uh if we're following the walking dead train of things no one is safe and that kind of makes me feel uh really anxious the entire time i'm reading the book right um so i don't know i i, I totally feel that nick i think that that's like a very valid look at it it's like what's in the zeitgeist right now and are you showing up too late to have a story that's relevant to actually tell um that's going to maybe feel old and tropish to people um is that like just a sensitivity we have it's very interesting 
Right. And it's like you you may have this idea that you've been working on for years, right? Like you've got this wholly original idea. You're not trying to cash on to cash in on anything. You've sure. been like developing this on your own and you feel quite passionately about it, et cetera, et cetera. And you just show up at the wrong time. Right. Mm-hmm. And like you might have an idea that blows that f- that blows Walking Dead out of the water, but you show up three years later and everyone just thinks you're trying to capitalize. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that because I've got a script in my closet <laughs> that it has to sit there for a couple more. No. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Fuck you, Kirkman. Yeah. No. Look at what Robert Fuck Kirkman you has done. And your backdoor Transformers <laughs> bullshit. Listen. We're not getting into that. Try to sneak that shit into my sci-fi romance. I see you. No, Nick, stop. We're trying to be friends with the Image Void Comics Rivals people. Hate podcast. All right, listen, 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 listen. Nick, I'm going to have you on the Transformers comic episode we're doing in the future. Don't you worry. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. To, we we should probably wrap up here pretty soon. Um, Paloma, I don't know if you had any last thoughts that you wanted to get out here that maybe anything we didn't cover. Anything out there that's, that's still left for us to talk about on your end? I feel like we covered it pretty well i don't want to always make it about superheroes but i think it would be cool talking point for like a future episode to be like how come some original superheroes work like why does invincible work why does like radiant black work and so many other like superheroes kind of like fall to the wayside yeah i i did want to i almost wanted to get into that i think if we had another 20 minutes I'd, Mm -hmm. i'd love to talk about that more um especially invincible i mean we should stop talking about robert kirkman uh <laughs> period but <laughs> just kidding just kidding um but that is a great question that is a great question like where where do the beats fit in that type of book um like where does a hellboy fit in why does hellboy mm-hmm. work uh, what kind of story formulas is mike mignola and his dozen other writers that he works with um following to make those books work right um but I think we'll have to wrap up for here. Sorry, Nick, to, to uncork that and then have to put the cork right back on. Uh, <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh boy. Come to, the, come to the next IRCB Discord hangout. We could definitely we could definitely talk about it. But uh, for now, I want to wrap things up. I want to say thank you to Paloma and Nick for being this episode. Uh, next week's episode, we're going to be doing a mini sode. It's just going to be me and a special guest. We're going to be talking to Oscar. I'm going to be talking to Oscar Rosario about comic books, about using Zoop as a as a platform for crowdfunding which i'm very curious about um we're going to talk about all that and more so look forward to that we won't be recording live just because it's labor day weekend i'm trying to give everybody a little bit of time off uh, i want to say you can always check us out on instagram tiktok twitter discord goodreads we've got our whole thing twitter is dead at this point sorry i said that but um whatever we've got our youtube channel which is doing really well um and you know if you want to hang out with us make sure to follow us on our patreon go to patreon.com slash ircb podcast to get access to all of our free updates as well as a bunch of other stuff um infinity shred is the best band in the universe they do all of our music xander traveled through the center of a black hole and survived that's it i want to say thank you again to Paloma and nick thank you to kate for proof listening thank you to everybody hanging out with us on discord and listening live and until next time comics are good and so are you